Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Inhaled Insulin, glucose management in the moment, and by Dexcom. Take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. Welcome to another week of the show. I am always so glad to have you here. You know we aim to educate and inspire about diabetes with a focus on people who use insulin. I'm your host, Stacey Sims. DIY, do-it-yourself, pump and CGM systems have been around for almost 10 years now. Uh, some of them probably more than that, but you know, publicly the We Are Not Waiting movement and the attention that it got within the diabetes community, just about 10 years, which is really hard for me to believe at least. It has contributed not only to quality of life in ways that are very hard to argue for many, many people, but it has also contributed to the commercial systems, to pushing these ahead in ways that are, I think, pretty easy to pinpoint. You can look at them and say, yeah, the, you know, that person did this, which then wound up at, at that company, that commercial company, which is now in front of the FDA for approval, that sort of thing. But the open source method has created ways of testing and iterating that otherwise would really be impossible or at least closed off in research facilities, right? I recently saw something that caught my eye. And while I'm still not 100% sure I understand it, I knew this audience would want to hear about it. Researchers at UVA published a study called Design and Validation of an Open Source Closed Loop Testbed for Artificial Pancreas Systems. They say what they have set up here is, quote, a valid tool that can be used by the research community to demonstrate the effectiveness of different control algorithms and safety features for APS, automated pancreas systems. In this interview, you're going to hear from Shugui Zhou and Homa Alamzada, two of the researchers on this study. Quick note, English is not their first language, and I know that can be difficult. This is audio. You want to understand it quickly. So I apologize in advance. I will tell you that I will make a transcript available for this episode as soon as possible. Hopefully, you know, as it's going live, if not very shortly thereafter. But to me, it was more important to speak to these really great folks. And let's face it, their English is a lot better than my Chinese or Farsi. So I hope the information um, is the priority here. And this podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. All right, my interview with Homa and Shugwe in just a moment. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Afreza. And one of the most frustrating parts of mealtime insulin can be the need to pre-bolus. I've seen my son, of course, forget to do it or hesitate because he's not confident about mealtiming in a restaurant, you know, when he's out and about. Afreza is unique because it is the only ultra rapid acting inhaled insulin available. Once you breathe Afreza into your lungs using the inhaler, insulin appears in your bloodstream in less than a minute, and it may start reducing blood sugar in about 12 minutes. Afreza allows you to inhale your insulin right when food arrives, even unexpectedly, so you can be spontaneous but still in control without the need for injections at mealtime. Find out more and see if Afreza is right for you. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Afreza logo. Afreza can cause serious side effects, including sudden lung problems and low potassium, and is not for patients with chronic lung disease, such as asthma or COPD, or for patients allergic to insulin. Tell your doctor if you've ever smoked, ever had kidney or liver problems, a history of lung cancer, or if you're pregnant or breastfeeding. Most common side effects are low blood sugar, cough, and sore throat. Severe low blood sugar can be fatal. Do not replace long-acting insulin with Afreza. Afreza is not for use to treat diabetic ketoacidosis. Please see full prescribing information, including boxed warning, medication guide, and instructions for use on afreza.com slash safety. Shugwe and Homa, thank you so much for spending some time with me. I am so interested to see what we're going to find out today. Thanks for being here. Hello. Thanks for having us today. We're very excited to talk to you today. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Before we dive in, and I will be the first to say, I'm not exactly sure what I'm asking because I reached out to these folks after seeing a study that I can only understand a bit of, but I think this is so important to our community. Helma, when we're talking about this, to be clear, we're talking about some do-it-yourself stuff too, right? Open source, everything like that. Yeah, so actually, uh, one of the things that is really important for the researcher community, and I guess uh, beyond that, also like the patients who are interested in like the medical devices they're using, 
is the aspect of being open source. So because uh, as a researcher who has been in this area of medical devices in general, it's very hard to get your hands on a kind of the actual design and the software that is used in real medical devices, especially mm. if you want to develop a new algorithm or a new software, those are not available to the especially researchers in academia unless they're working with the industry or the company. So in general, for um, kind of any medical device, but also for APS, having this sort of open source software is really, really important. And I guess you have heard about uh, open APS project that is actually a do-it-yourself kind of uh, APS controller and uh, is a big project. People are kind of using it actually to solve the patient. We use the open APS because we want to have the ability to kind of change the software, kind of verify, validate it, and also like integrate it with realistic uh, glucose simulators to mimic what happens in real world. So with a commercial device, unless you're actually kind of inside the company or work with a a specific company, you probably don't have that kind of access, right? And this is a huge help for other researchers because there there are lots of other researchers in the community who want to work. They have very novel techniques, but they cannot test it because they don't have access to those software. Yeah, so that's the motivation for using it. Got it. This study that, that I had asked about, it says design and validation of an open source closed loop test bed. Does that mean that you designed a way to test these open source closed loop systems and that that can be replicated in the future like any new open source that is developed and you get the information form you kind of put through this? I mean, I guess I'm asking you what, what does test bed mean? Or does it mean that you tested this system, the one, you know, the, all the information you have, and now you're done and it's time to move on to something else? Yeah, that's a good question. So actually, the, I think that the I think you're asking about if this is generalizable. So I think yeah, the te- we are presenting a way to create a closed loop test bed, and the components of this test bed that we have are not something. I mean, part of it is actually what we develop, but some of them are actually already available, like Open APS, mm. the simulators that we actually modified. So we are proposing a way of creating this closed loop test beds that you can actually mimic the real operation of a game. I, I, as I mentioned, for the closed loop is important that you have the patient simulator giving uh, sensor measurements, simulated sensor measurements to the controller, and then the controller giving like insulin values. And this is actually a principle that we also follow in other medical devices we actually work on. Like, for example, surgical robots. Uh, I mean, I've, I don't know if you're familiar with them. It's another p- kind of case study we have in our lab, and we have simulators for it. And it's not just medical devices. We, they're also like kind of say for autonomous vehicles or like self-driving cars these days. People are testing them on the roads, but many companies are also looking into this kind of closed loop simulation in-house so that you, you don't kind of kill people on the road, right? So you have a kind of simulated, so you have a simulated environment of a kind of a realistic environment and the uh, controller of a car and all, everything that you can have to be as realistic as possible to test it. So what is key here is that we have designed um, a way of building this sort of closed loop simulation. That's the design part. And then we also show how we can validate it to make sure it's as realistic as possible. And then by validation, we mean that we compare it to real data from clinical trials. We show that we can actually replicate that in simulation. And then we also show that um, we can compare different controllers. Uh, we We can actually integrate any different kind of patient simulator we want to have. So if someone wants actually to kind of now test a new controller, a new glucose simulator, patient simulator, they can just actually plug it in into our platform. So this is already open source available on GitHub. And if other researchers want to kind of experiment with it or like they want to add a new controller or a new a glucose simulator, like a meal simulator, they can do that. I think it's just the beginning for maybe other things we can do in the future. That's fabulous. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting. How do you measure accuracy on something like this? Is it about blood glucose in a certain range? How do you check it? What do you check it against? You know, we uh, built a code to system uh, that consists of basically two parts. One is the simulators, which are trying to uh, mimic the patient di- uh, dynamics, basically the um, blood glucose dynamics. And another part is the control algorithm. So we want to validate that the Simulators were integrated into this platform can accurately uh, represent the uh, BG trajectories uh, that have been recorded in the clinical trial. So we can compile uh, piecewisely for the accuracy for the uh, blood glucose values. And then we want to also compile or validate whether the control algorithms we've integrated into this test bed can make the reasonable decisions on the output of the uh, insulin doses. So basically giving 
the same input of their uh, BG values, which you can measure by their BG sensors, it can output their exact or same the amount of their insulin doses with their clinical records, which can come from the commercial insulin pumps. So basically, we compile the outputs of the uh, simulators and the controllers with the commercial products uh, in the clinic trial. This might be a very dumb question. I may have misunderstood. Are you looking at actual people or are you looking at their results and then comparing those against other results? In other words, do you, do you have people in your lab? <laughs> no, we do not have people in our lab. So we took our public available data set, which was collected by the UVA Diabetes Center. So they have 168 diabetes patients. So they well their insulin pumps, they well their glucose um, uh, sensors. So they have a lot of data there. So we know the BG values of the patient at a different time in the day and what uh, contractions the, the insulin pump has been output to the patient. So we can take that data set for our study to do the validations here. Homo, what did you find? Do these open source DIY systems, do they hold up? Yeah, so actually, I think there are two questions there, if I can step back a little bit to kind of clarify something. Yeah, so I wanted to explain something. So you ask about, like, how do you test the system? So I think in general, like, I think the regular path would be like, there would be some testing in the kind of in-house in the company that they develop this sort of uh, algorithms, whatever algorithms they're developing for control, like APS controller. Uh, but also, as you know, they do clinical trials with real patients, right? But as a kind of like, a, if you want to think of like how we can uh, mimic the real kind of scenario that you have an APS device with a patient in the loop, like it's actually working during a day, uh, the best setup would be if you have a closed loop system. By closed loop, we mean like that you have the software that is providing insulin rate and kind of values to a simulated patient. And then that simulated patient kind of glucose values change. And then you, you have even simulations for meal activity and other kind of factors. And then the measurements of the glucose from this simulated patient goes to this co- software, the controller, and then you kind of have this going on. So basically, you can run this sort of test by the simulator for hours. And that those hours might be actually much faster than real kind of hours in the real world. Yeah. And then try to test, yeah, t- try to test how this software behaves with different patient profiles. So the real benefit is that you don't have real patients, you have virtual patients. So the risk of harm is less. You don't need to kind of recruit patients. Also, the cost is less, right? You don't need to recruit patients. There is no risk. But the real challenge is that how you can have patients, simulated patients that are realistic or representative of actual patients in the world, right? Because you don't want to have like very toy examples or like you want to be as realistic as possible. I think the contribution of this paper work is that we are trying to look at the real data from clinical trials. So we have this uh, data from real patients, 168 patients that uh, Jube mentioned. And then we have this uh, glucose simulator that we kind of upgraded with estimating the parameters or like the patient characteristics from their data. So assume that I have like say five different patients from a clinical trial study and I have the glucose traces and insulin values from a pump. Then we have a method that we can actually uh, reverse engineer the patient parameters, like the uh, kind of the representing a profile of the patient that is kind of um, useful modeling how is their kind of a glucose sensitivity or insulin kind of uh, consumption and so on. And then these parameters are given to our simulator and then our simulator with any software, any control software like OpenAPS or any other one that we can have from even companies or other like researchers can work together in a kind of a simulated closed loop simulation, meaning that as if like a patient is using a pump. And then we can estimate uh, if the pump is doing what is expected to do. Then again, we can compare it to what is done in the uh, kind of a clinical trial. We can compare different controllers. And uh, this actually is a huge help. Again, saves the cost, actually helps the researchers to evaluate different controllers and so on. And then your question that you asked is that what we found. Uh, so we tried two different kind of controllers uh, for now, the open APS controller. And there is a, a controller that I think uh, is used by uh, many other studies. It's called Basal Bullets and also by um, the UVA kind of a study. They use the same controller. So we try to compare them in terms of what kind of insulin values they generate for the same patient glucose. And also, if there are actually faults, what I mean, we didn't talk about that yet, but if there are, say, unexpected behavior, like kind of, or like noise in the environment that might affect the functionality of the pump or the controller, which of them is more robust? So what happens actually in the, those scenarios? 
Well, let me ask you to follow up on that. Talk to me about the, the noise or the false readings. When it's kind of like when things go wrong, right? Because it's not perfect. Yeah, yeah. So that's the focus of like what we do in our group because, as I said, we work on safety and security of medical devices. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with like um, FDA databases. Like basically, FDA has different ways of like collecting information on when things go wrong with different devices. And many of our research in different medical devices, including APS, is motivated by real data from FDA. So there are these databases on recalls of medical devices or actually uh, adverse event reports that are submitted by the patients, doctors, or users of devices. And they just basically go to the FDA databases internally, and a portion of that is actually publicly available. So I don't know if any, I mean, everyone knows about it, but actually you can go to FDA website and then search for a certain kind of device name or manufacturer, and then it shows you the recalls that were issued and also a subset of adverse events, basically when somebody was using a device and something went wrong. So we have, uh, in our research before, we have developed tools that we can, this data is huge. So if you want to manually look for it, you want, you might not be able, you might not be able to get all of the data. I can barely and, understand yeah. the abstract that I got. <laughs> yeah, but I'm it, sorry, go ahead. There are millions, no, no, but there are millions of records for just a single device if you search for it. And it's basically impossible to read it manually, right? So what we have done in our research before is that we have developed tools that we can automatically mine the FDA website, basically the databases, and pull out the statistics on different types of devices. So if you tell me, for example, I want to know how, how many recalls I have for, like, say, a surgical robot or insulin pump or some other medical device, our tool can actually give you some estimates on that. I mean, estimates because things change all the time, like the sure. FDA website gets uh, uh, updated. So yeah, this was one of the kind of main works that we have done in our group and we keep up updating that. So, and that actually has motivated a lot of our research. So for APS, for example, if you look at the paper, we looked exactly on like uh, these databases to find out how many recalls or what type of recalls were reported for glucose monitors, for insulin pumps. And we couldn't find much on APS controllers because they're very new. So they're just kind of the, the first one just got approved recently. And there are not many reports on those, but I mean, for actual pumps and the monitors themselves, there are lots of kind of, I mean, not, I mean, there are a number of uh, recalls and rough compared to other devices are not many, but number sure. of recalls and adverse events. And then we look into these reports and then try to find out as much as we can, because the reports are also very high level abstract. They don't share all the details. I mean, if you really want to know, you need to probably dig into like the company records or like talk to FDA. But based on what we have publicly available, we try to understand what was the cause of it, what kind of defect it was. And some of these are like software bugs, like for example, the controller, the software that was written for that controller had a bug in it that caused, say, the pump to do something weird, or like the pump itself had a bug or like a malfunction. And then if you look at the paper, we list some examples of those. Um, there were like a total of, I think, 50, around 50 recalls for insulin pumps and then 50 for a glucose monitors in the years we looked at, like 2012, 2021. And then uh, we tried to see, okay, can we somehow simulate the effect of these defects also in our simulator? So say I have now this controller and this patient simulator, they're working together as like kind of a virtual patient with a pump. And then can I somehow simulate the effect of having one of these defects up suddenly happening? So as soon as the patient is using the pump and suddenly like the pump shuts off because there is a software bug or like the value goes to something very large because there is a bug in one of the algorithms that was, I mean, coded. And then we try to see how the controller behaves when these faults happen because some of the controllers, for example, OpenAPS that we have studied, it has actually safety mechanisms in place uh, to detect some of these things. So if it sees that, say, the glucose, I mean, the insulin value is going to be very high or like the glucose is something abnormal, it tries to kind of fix it, right? And not everything is fixed. Not all the kind of safety or security issues that might be there might be addressed, but some of them are addressed. One of the main motivations of this work is to study the effect of this kind of unexpected events or defects that might happen and to see how resilient or robust are these different controllers against those events. And this is very helpful, again, for not probably like for the patient, but for maybe informing the kind of the companies or like the developers to know, hey, we have this kind of similar kind of bug that was reported not for your device, but for another device in FDA database. If you have it, then you might get in trouble, right? So it would be good to kind of fix it, right? So it's like kind of learning from past failures to fix the future devices. Yeah, yeah. And let me just ask Shugui or Homa, you can jump in if this is something you can answer too. Shugui, after listening to Homa say all of that, is this the kind of thing where you will share your findings 
with all the companies? Is this something that they seem to be interested in or is this more theoretical? Yeah, so we would like to share this, uh, the findings we, we found in the research to the other companies too, but we haven't. So we just popped the paper on the conference. So we haven't like updated the, the issue we found for specific control algorithms or for the CTM to the company yet. So then the next question I would ask, and again, Shugo, you can answer this, is so what is next? Are you continuing with this study? Is there another one you're turning your attention to? Yeah, so there are several projects going on in our, our uh, young group. So at least one of them. We will keep to update this test bed. So uh, the current one we integrated can, so they only consider, you know, a single uh, mirrors in the, in the day. So we want to consider, uh, make it more realistic. Let's say we have three mirrors uh, a day, or we have also want to consider their different activities, also their mirror inputs. So yeah, we want to make this test bed more realistic and closer to the real implementation with the real patient. You're at UVA where my understanding is this is where the type zero algorithm was developed, which became what we now know as control IQ, which is what my son uses. Are you all working? I don't know if I should ask or can ask this. Homa, are you sharing this information with them? Did you compare anything with control IQ in this study? No, we, we have actually shared this with them. So we have been in touch very recently, like trying to share uh, kind of a paper and then try to kind of start some discussion. But we don't. We have not really looked at their specific software because I, I think that's kind of closed. They cannot share it with uh, public. Yeah, just like I can say that in, we are aware of some of the things they're doing. Uh, kind of the things are publicly okay to kind of discuss or publish on. And in another project that we are also working on safety, like we have a kind of we collaborate with one person who actually again they are not disclosing anything that is kind of internal information, but like kind of it has experience working. She has experience working with them, so. But yeah, we have us just recently contacted them and trying to kind of see if we can find a way to kind of work together. The problem is that as researchers, we always want to publish papers. And again, the open source publicly available, but then the companies have a different model, right? So from my experience working with uh, some other medical device companies, usually we, we, can, we sign NDAs and then things become like you cannot publish it, right? So then, yeah, so it's a kind of a trade-off between these two aspects, right? I don't know if you can answer this, so I'll ask it very carefully. And I'd like to ask both of you, Shugui, I'll start with you. OpenAPS is one of a few do-it-yourself uh, closed loop or artificial pancreas systems. We've got a few different names for them now. I'm curious if you think just from what you've seen in your studies here, are they safe? We've had lots of studies published. They were just published in the New England Journal of Medicine that says, yes, these are safe. Um, you know, they've been around for quite some time. But there's a lot of people in the diabetes community who worry about trying them. I don't know if you can answer that. I didn't tell you I was going to ask. I hate to put you on the spot. But just from what you've seen in these studies, what do you think? Yeah, this is really a tough question. And I, and I should be really careful because I don't want, I don't want to scare the, you know, the diabetes uh, community. So I would say this is really an advanced control algorithm. It is really an advanced algorithm that, you know, do even better than most of the commercial insulin pumps, but, you know, even their product with their most strict design and validation, they are still vulnerable to extended forts or some, you know, malicious attacks. So there are still some potential safety issues, but I think most of the time they are safe. Just add one thing that, like, when people talk about safety, it's not an absolute uh, kind of thing. It's like, actually, I just have a book in front of me about Safety of autonomous vehicles, like, is the same kind of concept, like, we hear about, like, self-driving cars these days. So, basically, it's about, like, how safe it is, right? So, it's, like, also a question of how you can measure it, like, how you can quantify safety, right? That's also kind of something that researchers are asking a lot these days. But, like, uh, yeah, so what should we mention is actually true. Uh, what we are talking here is about, like, especially with the devices that are advanced in the, on the market with FDA approval process and everything. We are talking about very rare events, things that basically I'm, I'm t telling you about like 50 cases over like millions of devices are on the market, right? So it's like, these are rare things that happen, but if they happen, then they affect lots of devices, right? So if a single defect is found, they need to replace all those devices, millions of them or like upgrade them. Yeah, I think we can say generally they're safe, especially with open APS, we found that actually they have, as I said, we analyzed the uh, software also using some tools. We found that they actually have some do have some safety mechanisms in place for some of the issues that might happen. But with any software, even like the most advanced ones, the things I use every day, there are actually faults and more importantly, security attacks that might actually target them, but they're very rare. 
But what we want to make sure if the, those rare things happen, also patients are safe and we can prevent them from happening. And then my last question is, and I, I again should have asked this earlier on, do either one of you have any kind of personal connection to diabetes? And it's fine if not, I just always like to ask. I myself I had my grandmother having it, but um, yeah, that was the only connection. But in general, uh, as I said, my yeah, the main reason we got interested in it was because actually, in addition to be like the only, I mean, being at UVA is actually, I don't know if you know about it, like artificial pancreas systems are one of them very first probably like autonomous medical devices that are actually being approved by FDA. Uh, mm-hmm. By autonomous, I mean that there is a controller that basically you give input to it, but basically is making decision about your kind of treatment autonomously and then giving that to a pump. And then the pump is actually kind of providing that to your body, right? So this notion of autonomous uh, kind of control or like treatment is not really there yet for medical domain. And uh, the reason we really got interested in this was that because this is one of the maybe closest one to like something like self-driving car in medicine, right? Uh, the other type of software that is used in like medicine that are like they're using some sort of intelligence or like machine learning, they're not really doing it like directly by giving it to a pump. They're actually having patients or doctors in the loop to approve it and then provide the treatment. But here, with fully autonomous uh, artificial pancreas systems, it's like really the first step towards going back to autonomy in medicine, which is also very safety critical, right? The reason we got interested in it was like, it's very important to ensure it's safe and secure for the patient. That's great. Shugui, how about you? Yeah, I think same there, maybe. So my grandma's sister was diagnosed with her diabetes. I don't remember when, maybe uh, 20 years ago or mm. sometime close to that, but passed away maybe 10 years ago. So I know that this was really a severe, serious illness. So I, I was hoping that uh, she would be able to use this kind of the, uh, artificial pancreas system at that time. So mm. that might be helpful to relieve some of the pain is. <laughs> But it's interesting. I, I really think, as Homa said, I wasn't thinking about it as one of the few or only medical autonomous systems. That's It really is pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, it's also concerned to make sure we ensure safety, right? I, I always use self-driving car analogy because <laughs> people relate to that better, but that's what we see in everyday life these days. They say, oh, we're going to have a car that drives. So it's similar. Like in medicine, we don't have it yet. And this is, I think, one of the few that is happening right now that is kind of adding much, I mean, uh, autonomy or like intelligence into like uh, controlling our body and like real world, yeah, I mean, everyday life. Yeah. So I think one thing to mention is that, so uh, this is the design and validation we test pad and in our lab, we also um, have some safety works when trying to build a safety monitor to protect this open APS. You know, this is an advanced system as we mentioned, and but that might be some safety vulnerabilities. So uh, in our lab, we also offer a, a solution or approach to protect this open APS system to make it more uh, safe. Yeah, actually, that is the main, um, also like the main starting point that motivated this test uh, to kind of um, how we can test those monitors now, basically, if you have some safety checking in a place, how do we know we are doing well and we need a kind of a test to test it in the, in the, within that and Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate you spending some time to explain it. Your patience was wonderful too, as well with me. So thank you so much. And I hope we can talk again soon. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. More information. And again, I will link to the transcript at diabetes-connections.com. All of those links are in the show notes. You can read the study for yourself and learn more about what these researchers are trying to do. Up next, a little bit of a report from our endocrinologist, one of Benny's recent appointments. And I want to talk about event stuff as well. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. It's pretty amazing to think back how we used to do blood sugar checks before share and follow. We actually had them on a timer. We would check doing a finger stick the same times every day at home and at school. Of course, we'd add in if we needed to. But it is amazing to think about how much our diabetes management has changed with Share and Follow. Using the Share and Follow apps have really helped us talk less about diabetes, which I never thought would happen with a teenager. Benny loves that part too, me talking about diabetes less. 
And that's what's so great about the Dexcom system. I think for the caregiver or the spouse or the friend, you can help the person with diabetes manage in the way that works for their individual situation. Internet connectivity is required to access Dexcom Follow. Separate follow app required. Learn more. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. We had to reschedule our endocrinology visit that, of course, we set up like you probably do every three months well in advance. And probably like where you live, it's really difficult if you have to reschedule because they're always so busy. We got really lucky, though, because and I didn't know this. Apparently for years now, Dr. Vanderwell, our, our local endocrinologist, has been having Monday night hours. He stays in the office till something like eight o'clock at night so he can see patients who otherwise, you know, are, are have a hard time getting to the office during the day, which is fantastic. And we've always been a really early morning family, longtime listeners, if you've known us for a long time, you know that I used to do super early morning radio and that kind of stuff. So it was never a problem for us to get down there early. But they had a Monday night opening just a couple of days after we had to reschedule. So it was perfect. We live about 45 minutes from this endo. So we usually make it not a day of it, but at least a meal of it. We go and we have breakfast or lunch in these fun places that are down by the South Park Mall area. So Benny decided that he wanted to go to Cowfish, which is this really fun it's like a it's cowfish sushi crossed with burgers. I think there's one at Universal in Orlando, but it's a Charlotte company that has them. I think they've expanded. I think there's one in Raleigh, but if you've got one near you, they're really fun. So I posted this on social media. He had this ridiculous cheeseburger sushi thing. Um, he said it was delicious. Of course, he ate all of it. I know most of us don't like to have like a huge meal before you go to the endo. That's supposed to be what you do after. But at this point, whatever. I mean, but he's just doing his own thing. We had a great visit. And by that, I don't mean like numbers because I don't share those, although he's doing fine. I just mean it's, it's just so great to have an endocrinologist that we've seen this whole time talk to us about what's next. And we all realized sitting there that we have one more appointment, assuming we don't reschedule it, before Benny turns 18. And we're really lucky that we get to stay with this endocrinologist. We don't have to leave. He can see Benny all through college and I, I think up to his early 20s. But it's just such a milestone. To think about. I'm going to let that sink in a little bit later on when I'm ready because I'm not ready to have and my youngest child be 18 years old. But man, we are getting close. So I will change the subject to something much easier, which is to talk about my schedule. <laughs> we do have a lot of fun stuff coming up in the next couple of weeks. I'm going to be traveling to Healthy Voices, which is a delayed from 2020 conference. I think I first went to Healthy Voices in 2017. This one this year has all the people that were accepted as speakers and attendees in 2020. So that's in Philadelphia the last weekend of this month and the first weekend of October. It's always interesting because it's not just for diabetes advocates. I'm really interested to see who's coming this time around and what kind of resources and, and teachings they're going to do for us. So I will report back after that. Uh, the second weekend in October is Friends for Life in the Washington, D.C. area. I am not able to go this year, but if you are going, it's always a terrific conference. I will link up more information. I think the room block has closed, but you can certainly still attend if you're local. So I will link that up as well. In November, looking ahead, I will not get too far ahead of myself, but I have some really fun stuff coming up. The book launch will be happening in November. I've got a local event here on the 15th. Uh, but before that, I'm going to Florida for Macy's Believers. They have a great event the second weekend in November. I will link up more information about that. If you're in the Port St. Lucie area or really anywhere within driving distance, they're doing a really fun weekend to raise money for diabetes charities. And then, of course, January will be Mom's Night Out. You guys, I am so excited about this. If you haven't registered for your spot and you are interested in this conference, I'm telling you, please register as soon as possible. We have a, an event capacity for this one and the response has been terrific. I think we're going to hit it sooner than we thought. So please make sure to register for Mom's Night Out if this is something you are remotely interested in. And I really appreciate all the people I've heard from all over the country who want me to bring a Mom's Night Out event to them. Man, I would love to do that. So stay tuned. Okay. Thank you, as always, to my editor, John Buchanan from Audio Editing Solutions. Thank you so much for joining me. We will have a newscast later this week, so I will see you then. Until then, I'm Stacey Sims. Be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged. <laughs>